Welcome to the Relevance Report, where we meet relevant global industry leaders who are driving impact and shaping the future. Today, we're with Pablo Henderson, the head of marketing for Equinox Hotels, a division of Equinox. Welcome, Pablo. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. So I'd love to just shake things up and get personal right off the bat, because why not? Okay. Uh, some people might not know who you are, Pablo. You're you're the head of marketing at Equinox Hotels and, and really a dynamic global marketing leader who's worked in the hospitality business for what, 25 years now? It's, you know, you, right. you've, yeah. you've really, you know, made a name for yourself and anyone who's in the hospitality realm does know of you. But for a lot of our listeners and viewers, they might not. So I'd love to just tell your story, uh, just sort of starting from, I know you have roots in the UK where we have an office as well. So we have listeners over there. Um, but I'd love, I'd love to just hear a little bit about Pablo. Cool. Uh, grew up in Northwest London in a neighborhood called Kensal Rise, just north of Labrock Grove and Notting Hill. Uh, it's quite a trendy area to live in now. At Beautiful. the time, it was very blue collar. Uh, I grew up in a... Um, a neighborhood that was predominantly um, immigrants from the Caribbean, um, some, some Polish immigrants, uh, West African um, and East Indian. And I went to an international school in Kensington um, because my mother's French, my father's from Trinidad and Tobago. And that education and that experience at the French Lycée in Chelsea really served to influence me and my worldview beyond Kensal Rise and the neighborhood that I grew up in. And while I, to this day, consider myself a Londoner, and I think that that experience shaped me probably more than anything else, the juxtaposition of the neighborhood that I grew up in and the school that I went to during those really formative years mm -hmm. um, it, led me to want to go and see the world and sample it in a very unique way. And um, I was always intrigued by human behavior and psychology and culture and anthropology to some extent, but didn't really know how to express it. Mm. Um, I ended up uh, traveling and found that as a good way to um, feed that appetite. Mm -hmm. And then I, I land, I've traveled around Europe a lot because that's something that just teenagers and young adults do in Europe is they travel around Europe. There used to be this thing called the interrail pass and you could go to any country you wanted in Europe mm. within a 30 day span. And I, I mean, I went crazy with that thing. <laughs> and you just, <laughs> just get on trains and travel around. And it was a good way to observe people and learn. And, and I think that probably gave me my first kind of inkling into hospitality subconsciously. And then I went to mm -hmm. uh, live in South America for a little while. And I started working for the Carter Center, um, uh, an institution that was founded by uh, former President Carter, mm -hmm. uh, working on elections and human rights work, and uh, then got a posting in East Africa spent a year living in Ethiopia, but I hadn't finished university. And I looked around a lot of the other people around me who you know, not only had a bachelor's degree, but most of them had masters and PhDs and realized that if I wanted to pursue um, a career um, that was even remotely tied to political science um, or the work that we were doing at the time, I would need to at least you know, finish school. Mm -hmm. um, the Carter Center was based in Atlanta. Uh, headquarters were based in Atlanta. I would go back there to report occasionally, but I was unfamiliar and never lived with it in the States. I got a, an opportunity to go to college at Emory, mm. uh, got a degree in psychology there, and then did the next most obvious thing and uh, opened up a nightclub. <laughs> I love it. Well, you, you read the room all the way into becoming the room to be in, right? And and uh, used your psychology degree to to create, you know, influence basically, right? To go into the nightclub world, that's amazing. And and how did you get into, you know, from from the nightclub experience, which I, I read that about you and I thought that was fascinating. Um, 
how, how did you make the leap from the, from the nightclub world, which is really different, you know, being a promoter. I mean, it is, and it isn't right. You, you, you definitely, um, are creating an experience and influencing people, but, but how is it, how has it translated into your, your jump over into hotels? Yeah. I mean, when I was at Emory, uh, most of the kids, I call them kids, but we were young adults by that point, were all getting ready to graduate. And most of them were graduating from the Goizueta Business School, mm -hmm. um, one of the top MBA programs in the country. And um, they all had places that they were going to, very traditional career paths. Mm. Uh, that they were accessing through various means, through relationships in their family, through having done all the right things, or the internships leading up to that and whatnot. And I had one friend of mine who was a bit of a, a rebel, also was in the business school, and, and he was curious about entrepreneurship hmm. and said, look, I'm going to open up this nightclub, and I know that you've had a lot of experience with promoting. I'd love you to, um, to lead the project for me, and you're good with people, and that's the, the main thing that I'm, I'm looking for, and I trust you. Hmm. And, um, and so when I got into the nightclub business uh, with funding from, from my friend from, from the business school, we went in um, not really knowing what we were doing, but uh, learned the business quite quickly. Basically, you're managing this inventory that you have, which is the alcohol, and you're making sure that you sell it without you know, any wastage uh, and that you, know, you manage your, your expenses. And uh, while I was in that, in that phase of my life, fine tuning the business side, mm -hmm. solving for all of the things that come about when you manage any business, dealing with humans, right? It's a, yes. <laughs> um, uh, managing people, um, uh, the marketing, the accounting, um, making sure that you are making sound decisions. Uh, I realized that a lot of what I was doing would would help me later on in life but i did not know to what extent and so i i, I own nightclubs for 13 years and then in 2007 2008 2009 things went really badly mm -hmm. uh you know we we hit an economic crisis here in the yeah. states with the recession um much of my personal investment was in real estate and I was very poorly positioned, given that everything that I uh, owned and operated was in the hospitality business, but on the restaurant and bar and nightclub side, all of which were hurting pretty badly at that time. That was a rough time. Oh. A very rough time. The good news, uh, the other thing is that I had formed a consultancy um, which kind of offset some of that. But the bad news was that all of my clients were hoteliers mm -hmm. who needed um, marketing savvy um, in the food and beverage space because hoteliers are very good at operating hotels, but not great at creating like the hot spot bar or, or nightclub within the hotel. So yeah, um, right. So that was um, difficult because contracts just started to dry up. I mean, overnight, they were just canceling contracts and I was just just drowning, to be honest with you. And I went back to one of my former clients, Starwood, and I said, you know, I'm desperate. I just need something right now to weather this storm. Um, and somebody said to me, listen, the W brand, and I'd done consulting for Starwood and for the W brand um, in Atlanta, where at the time they had four Ws. Um, and they, the, somebody said, listen, I, I, I've got an entry level type situation for you. It's, it's really, you know, you're far more experienced than the role deserves, but it's a foot in the door. Mm -hmm. And if you can just hang in there for a few months, something else will open up that I can put you in. Um, but I think this is a good brand fit for you and someone like you. And I also, at that time, didn't really understand what they meant. Um, but 
um, with a leap of faith, I took the, the opportunity and I uh, ended up working in a food and beverage role within um, uh, a specific property in Atlanta, in downtown Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And six months later, the marketing manager ended up um, quitting um, to, to pursue something else and, and recommended me for the role. Then the senior marketing person in Atlanta um, decided to pursue something else or got a promotion and they recommended me. And so in this like tic-tac-toe effect of very quick successive moves, I went from you know ground floor opportunity to senior marketing person. And then an opportunity arose at the headquarters in Stanford where Starwood was based at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, to to launch a new brand um, in America called Le Meridian. Mm -hmm. Um, And Le Meridian had had a couple of hotels in North America. It was a a French heritage brand from the 60s and had uh, been launched in the 60s by Air France, but didn't really have a presence in North America. And so that was my first opportunity to prove myself um, in hospitality, and I jumped at the chance, moved my family up to Stamford, Connecticut. Uh, well, we moved to Fairfield, but worked out of Stamford. And I knew that given the priority that the brand was within the company, I had an opportunity to, to really make a name for myself and, and, and do some good work. Um, and when I found myself in that situation, it was only then at the in the in the depths of you know uh, corporate America, mm-hmm. um, with the bureaucracy and uh, the administration and being part of a public company, that I realized that the thing that set me apart from everybody else was that uh, at, at the foundation of who I was, I was an entrepreneur, and none of those other people really were. They were very good at their jobs, and certainly mm-hmm. people that I. I respect to this day tremendously, but the entrepreneurial spirit was lacking in in corporate America um, at, at that level, and so I I seized on that opportunity. That's incredible. So the thing I notice about you and your storytelling is, you know, you you're really um, passionate, and it, it comes through in the way that you speak. You're really passionate about what you do, and your story is is fascinating, but also not that different from a lot of other people who have really gone from, you know, maybe something that, you know, they weren't expected to take this path. And then they took a leap of faith somewhere along their journey and big things happen. And I do think that that's a common thread with entrepreneurs. There's something about that entrepreneurial spirit that they're willing to take a risk. They're willing to go for it. And what I also find unique is that someone saw that in you very early on. They they gave you that chance. They knew you could do it. They could feel it. It's like an energy, an entrepreneurial energy. And that's really something special. So for, for our listeners who might not be sure what path their life's going to take, maybe they're young, they don't know what they want to do. How, do. how do you know when you have that? Because, I mean, I even find as someone who's running an agency and, and I'm always looking for someone with that entrepreneurial spirit. And sometimes people, they're, they're really not sure, you know, how, how much am I willing to put my, my heart and soul into making this a success? And they're still figuring it out. Do you have any tips on how you really suss that out internally and, and discover your entrepreneurial spirit within yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are several layers to that. Mm-hmm. One is the idea that you have to understand what drives you and is motivating you. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been motivated by different things at different stages of my life. Sure. Uh, money was one of them at one point, you know, just purely greed. Like, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it's just a fact. You know, I went into the nightclub business because I didn't have lots of great options at the time, but mm-hmm. I felt like it was going to be something that led to something else. Mm-hmm. And it, and and my plan kind of did work out, but not the way I thought it did. I thought I would get in, I was in Atlanta and I thought that a Coca-Cola executive or someone would, would notice me and I, that would lead to, you know, bigger and better things. 
or that being around people that came to the nightclub, affluent people, there would be some startup opportunity and then I would be that person and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So putting yourself in the, in the right place, but also knowing what your motivations are, are, I think is key. I think that one of the things that I've seen is a desire to be entrepreneurial, but an unproven track record mm -hmm. in doing things to build up your belief. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I was an entrepreneur from the time I was like six, eight, 10, 12. Like, <laughs> you know, if you've never set up a lemonade stand, it's likely that you're not an entrepreneur. <laughs> you know, if you've never tried to sell Girl Scout cookies, you're probably not an entrepreneur. Like, mm -hmm. read the signs, you know. Mm. Um, uh, and That's a good point. I, you know, I was always a hustler in one way or the other. Mm. And I, I mean hustler in a good way, you know. Like, I had a paper, I had a, um, in the old days, and they still do to some extent, but in England, the people don't have big driveways, especially in, like, the heart of London. Mm -hmm. um, so you walk around, the, you deliver the newspapers by walking door to door and sticking the newspapers through someone's uh, door. You can't just like fling it out a car, you know, on a big <laughs> road, like in the States. Right. And, and I worked for this gentleman called Mr. Patel who owned a corner shop in, in Kensal Rise. And, and gradually because I was punctual and I showed up despite the crappy English weather, <laughs> And I never complained about the weight of the bags because these were paper boy bags and the newspapers in England in, are very, very thick. It's not like the New York Times, which is like a relatively thin. It's like the Sunday edition of the New York Times yes. every day, you know? Yes. And, um, and I would carry these heavy, heavy bags and not have to reload. And then I would take on other kids' paper routes. Eventually, I was doing four or five paper routes before getting to school. And... I think it was like 11 pounds a week that I would get um, doing a paper round. And I was making 50, 60 pounds a week, you know, like for a little boy, you know, that was wow. money, you know? Um, so I, I tell you that because you have to know deep down inside of you, do I have that side of me? And not fall in love with the idea of being an entrepreneur mm -hmm. or the idea of being something else or the idea of taking the risk, but having some proof of, of by that point that you've done it in the past. Um, I also think that the other piece that's really important is uh, taking small bets. You mm. know, I, I've taken a lot of risks and the, the big mistake that I made um, during the crash was that I took big risks, um, partly out of greed again. Um, you know, I acquired real estate. Um, you know, we, we got into nightclub projects. We bought, you know, things that had devastating repercussions if they went wrong. Mm -hmm. even, if the, even if the what if things go wrong seems far-fetched, like the entire real estate market right. in America crashing, you know, um, <laughs> uh, virtually overnight. The what if you should be able to handle the what if, no matter how far fetched it is. And so, um, I don't worry about making small bets and small mistakes. I fail. I try to make it a, a point to fail every week. Like I try to screw something up, like um, because. If I don't, then I'm not really on top of my game, you know? Well, and, I, and yeah, and I agree. And also you're probably not challenging yourself enough because you grow through pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, right? So you've got to figure out, can I, can I do this or can I not? And you know what, you, you can fail, but bounce back quickly, right? So um, I, I did read that you're passionate about really accomplishing your personal best and you've done some coaching around uh, you know, be young, maybe, I don't know if they're young entrepreneurs or who you're coaching. Um, but, yeah, but it, so. you, you like to help people discover their personal best. And that, that is something that I think, you know, through your story, I'm, I'm getting, you know, that yes, you might've started out in greed, but you've really evolved quite a bit, uh, with, with the way, uh, you run your coaching business and everything now to help others along the way. So yeah, talk, talk to us a little bit about how you're, 
helping the next generation? Well, you know, I've I've often wondered why I didn't have a specific talent, you know, like why was I not given some you know, <laughs> specific talent that that I could um, celebrate. And, uh, you know, now I'm in my mid to late 40s, I'm 47. And I look back at what the red thread throughout my life has been. And whether it's my own children, whether it's coaching young you know girls to play soccer whether it's mentoring uh, folks who are on um, various teams within the organization at various stages of their careers uh, whether it's you know my own podcast about motivation or hosting a room on clubhouse mm -hmm. the red thread has been around you know um hopefully trying to help others in some regard, even if it's uh, on a short term basis, um, by just, you know, being able to connect or provide a, a network, or, or, or some advice, or whether it's been through the opportunity to have long lasting, um, real mentorship relationships. And so I feel like the idea of coaching is the one singular red thread mm -hmm. throughout my life at a personal and a professional level. And I think that, you know, just like when, when I sometimes do um, volunteer um, lectures, you know, at universities, uh, I learn more and I get more out of the experience than mm. I'm sure the students do, right? So mm. it's having someone ask you a completely left field question or ask you the most basic question and you struggle to explain it in simple terms that's when you know that you're being challenged and tested. And so I love, I love even that aspect. And so I often um, raise my hand for those types of opportunities. Cause as I said, you know, I get more out of them than <laughs> I think anybody else does. Yeah. I, I'm not a formal coach of any kind other than my volunteer time with, you know, parks and rec uh, in the mm -hmm. past. Um, uh, so I don't want anyone to feel like I'm a, a life coach or anything. That is not what I am. I'm just someone who is, identified that as that as a really um meaningful growth mechanism for myself and and so this is really interesting because you know i i'm really aware that people need leadership at this moment in time especially i think you have a great opportunity to take all these life skills that you're ob obviously maximizing right now to help others along the way you're you're absolutely championing a successful brand with Equinox um, hotels, of which I know you're, you're planning several more in the coming years and there's growth, there's expansion, but there have been a lot of challenges, obviously, through this last year. And, you know, I think it's, it's a great opportunity for you to, you know, really drive forward your purpose as you're doing, as well as still being successful you know you it's an it's an amazing dichotomy you can be both you can still want to be successful and you can also still want to have a greater purpose and that's why you're such a great guest for the relevance report because we really do find that actually a lot of people don't know this but there is a deeper meaning behind most of the successful people especially who are able to rebound quickly with a setback like this pandemic um, I know that you're active with the Achilles Foundation and, and a couple other things. You're, you're championing other causes along the way. Um, and I know you've also been helping uh, the Equinox family kind of help with the Equality and Belonging Leadership Council. Um, you know, we uh, read that about you as well. So you're really championing a lot of good things. And the whole time you're dealing with oh my gosh, is anyone gonna be able to come to a hotel right now? Is anyone going to even be able to eat at a restaurant? I mean, how are you reimagining dining and staying at these hotels? Uh, you know, and, and how, talk to us a little bit about, given all of this, you're, you're doing so much, it's incredible, but how are you driving the vision forward for Equinox Hotels with, okay, how are we bringing it back? Talk to me a little bit about, about that. Yeah, I mean, I 
I've been very, very fortunate in the uh, context of Equinox Hotels in that uh, I joined a team of all-star players. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, whatever sports analogy you want to use, I got onto a team where I was not the rock star, you know, uh, everybody else um, was famous in their own regard for whatever they did and their area of specialty. And mm -hmm. when you surround yourself with a really strong team, it's a lot easier to win. Um, mm -hmm. If you're the one that's, you know, everyone's relying on you to be the best player or the smartest person in the room, then that's a different type of challenge. And I, I have rarely found myself in that place. I've often just been lucky to mm -hmm. be surrounded by best in class, best in the industry type people. And that has never been truer than, the, than, than during COVID, where we found ourselves like, wow, looking around and it's like, wow, it's great that we have got the best person to address food and beverage, the best person to address IT, ops, you know, I mean, that helps. Right. So um, that's, a, that's a luxury and a, and a privilege in itself. The other thing was that when you think of what Equinox stands for, what it represents, the idea of, of high performance living, mm -hmm. and it's three pillars of movement, nutrition, and regeneration. I can't think of a more relevant brand in the context of hospitality and travel in a post-COVID world than, than Equinox Hotels. And I don't say that to, to sound you know, arrogant, it's just we had no understanding that, this, that COVID would even happen when the, when the idea of the brand came about. But I think that what I've seen on the outside is a, um, a shift, a cultural shift towards a new understanding of wellness that we just happen to by good fortune in given difficult circumstances, um, be well positioned to receive and provide a solution for. I think um, from a leadership perspective, uh, the last year has probably been the hardest year of my life. Mm. Um, having to have difficult conversations, having to be able to make my team feel comfortable and assured despite the fact that I had no real concrete answers or ability to predict the future. Right. Um, putting some of my own personal emotions to the side so that I could be seen um, or perceived as somebody, you know, with who is strong with the vision. Mm -hmm. um, and just relying on a sound work ethic and putting out a quality of work that was, you know, um, unparalleled. I think that one of the things that I really respected about um, the senior leadership at Equinox is that um, there was constantly uh, a desire to, to go back out and be first and, mm. and, and, and try to implement the things that we're implementing at the highest level of quality without compromise. And in the case of Equinox Hotels or the flagship, we were one of the first luxury hotels to open back up in New York. And it was a really smart decision because it allowed us to show everyone, you know, what we had put in place to make our guests feel safe um, and, and to observe all of the protocols that were changing on a very, you know, rapid basis. Sure. Uh, for me, I, you know, I don't know what the next phase of all of this is. I know that my industry has been impacted in ways that will never be the same again. Um, but I do think that with that, it provides an opportunity. And, you know, you mentioned Achilles Foundation. Um, that, for those that don't know, that is an organization that provides opportunities to um, athletes with various uh, disabilities um, to to uh, participate in races. And so I serve as a guide either to wheelchair um, athletes or visually impaired athletes uh, at any distance from the five kilometers to marathon distance. Mm. And in many cases, they're often my inspiration because it's somebody who was 
um, you know, had full use of their um, um, all of their limbs and has had to reinvent at some point, or was, you know, had full use of their, their eyesight at one point, and now is having to, you know, run a marathon without being able to see. And so, you know, though that inspiration and in how you reinvent yourself or how you adapt um, mm -hmm. to, to make things work um, is at a very, you know, we started off talking about the human level is really what I tap into as a, as a source of inspiration. It's, it's, it's the root of all of what we're doing every day, right? We're, we're connecting humans. You're a natural connector. It's obvious through the way you've connected your talents and skills and, and the people who have helped create amazing products and solutions, right? You're definitely an inherent marketer, connector, innovator. And, you know, I love that you seem to champion mindfulness and thoughtfulness and what it is that we do every day. I mean, it's something that could so easily become rote. I, th I think marketing in general, I, people don't really rethink it often enough. This whole tragedy has really helped us as marketers, right? Rethink, why are we doing this the way we've always done it? How can we do it smarter? How can we really make more of an impact? And I think it's it's helped open us up to a new way of even marketing in general. I mean, I know for, for relevance, we've We've gone from a PR agency to a 360 agency and really innovated digitally and thought through our storytelling narratives. I mean, all sorts of different ways to reimagine um, the way we're telling our client stories through video, um, you know, and once we can actually do more activations, um, when people can come together, I think there are going to be new ways of marketing for sure. And then you combine that with the fact that you're reinventing the hotel experience and the restaurant experience. And I think it's gonna be exciting. It's gonna be great to go back to all of the urban centers and really, you know, sort of just see a reimagined uh, place that the creatives like us have really gotten a chance to noodle, right? Yeah, very much so. You know, one of the, I often ask, you know, my team WTF, <laughs> <laughs> what's this for? Mm. And if it's not providing value or it's not enhancing, then why are we doing it? You know, so uh, it's a good way to just keep going back to the to the root of why you're doing things. And um, often it comes down to not being additive, but removing layers and, and simplifying. Yes, we've had to, you know, um, add some layers due to COVID and uh, but when you think about what's worked the most, it's the simplicity uh, that we're providing. You know, we were in a good position because um, we had always been a tech forward brand, you know, with um, keyless, you know, entry, um, you know, and lots of things, you know, a completely digital experience that's, you know, that um, provides for touchless service. You know, all of those mm -hmm. things were in place, so we were quite lucky. But when I think of luxury service and modern luxury, mm -hmm. it's about things being anticipatory and being intuitive and being simplified, not adding extra layers. And so the stripping away to get to the purest form of where whatever it is that you're providing is what COVID has kind of challenged us to do in some regards. And that's where I think some of the new marketing will emerge. Uh, yes, it, it's been a tragedy and I've struggled on many days to figure out what the positives are beyond the personal time that I've now reclaimed with my family mm -hmm. um, and being far more present by being at home more often. Um, but I do think that it has stimulated some new ways of thinking and life balance and mindfulness is certainly one of them um so i think that, that hopefully will be a positive trend that comes from all of this and any negative trends that you're sick of and you're ready to do without any any things that you're feeling i mean okay, that can go so, away now <laughs> i mean there are so many um uh, little things that have come about either you know, unrelated to COVID or related, you know, from a from a Zoom call perspective or 
a Teams call or Google Meet or whatever it is, the back-to-back -back nature of how things are being scheduled. Mm, yes. <laughs> that, that, and the environment in which we are now conducting business is not providing the spaces in between for you to actually absorb the conversation, potentially record the conversation as far as not a red light appearing in the corner of the screen, but record it by writing down some some thoughtful notes after the meeting, um, uh, digesting kind of what was said, um, slowing down a little bit, and while somebody else is talking, truly listening as opposed to having faces looking back at you on the screen. The, the, the way we process information has changed, and I, I'd like to see if we can strike more balance there because I'm on back-to-back -back calls and I don't think that's my best me, right? Like the, my best me is taking a moment to noodle in my, my notepad that I'm holding up, you know, right <laughs> now, um, you know, yeah, uh, taking reading, some yeah, you know, just all the other aspects of how we absorb information and some of it is nonverbal, right? Absolutely. And we've lost some of that. Um, I think that the, you know, the themes around hate that we've seen just societally mm -hmm. um, that, you know, kind of came to a boiling point with the Black Lives Matter movement last summer, but have reared their ugly head this this year um, as a uh, an inflection point on what's been a year of consistent acts of violence against the Asian community is a trend that I would be happy to see go away immediately um, and Absolutely. is unacceptable. Um, I think that there is, you know, I thought that, I thought that the uh, abundance of digital experiences was going to make IRL, you know, anything that happened in real life um, more relevant. Um, but in fact, I'm seeing uh, a lot of people leaning into NFTs and, you know, things that are even more digital and non-tangible and tactile. And I think that while I don't want to sound like, you know, the old person who doesn't understand Bitcoin and blockchain and NFTs, um, I'm someone who values stamps. <laughs> you know, I, sorry, I just, I think there's beauty in a stamp, you know. I know it's irrelevant, but um, I love the tactile I love things that smell, that have a feel, mm -hmm. sometimes a piece of paper and, the, and the, you know, the way that paper feels against my fingertips is something that I value. So I, I hope that everything doesn't become digital and that we still have some, some love for, um, and that's the other piece with, with luxury. Um, you know, there's, there's this movement towards streetwear as luxury that confuses me. And I know that, uh, you know, what I'm saying is quite taboo, but, you know, luxury was a pair of Italian shoes, not because they were made in Italy, but because the person who made them there, the five generations of people with that same name have been making those shoes and their hands, you know, stitched and the leather is sourced from a certain place. And the quality, yes. The quality, right? Um, uh, Built to last. Putting something on a night, you know, uh, you know, putting something on a Nike sneaker, and that being luxury, um, you know, um, call me old school, but you know, it's not the same thing. It has its place, and I respect that place. But it, but it, but the term luxury, as we understood it, I think, is evolving and, and changing. Um, I agree. And I, and I think that luxury, so much about true luxury is sensory, what you just spoke about, the feel, the touch, the smell, like that, that's part of the experience that really does elevate it to a luxury experience. So it's important that we pay attention to what, what are those touch points and how do we make sure that we get them right with the luxury experience? Um, and I love what you said, Pablo, about we have to sort of slow down to to advance, slow down to speed up. Um, and and I couldn't agree more about the back to back zooms. I, I think it's <laughs> it's it it just sometimes I'm like my eyes I can't take it. My eyes are glazing over, and I can't do another Zoom call. Uh, but it's nice to just get to nature 
that's how I find my balance there. I, mm-hmm. I have uh, greenery in my backyard and I've never been more grateful for green space. And I get off the Zooms and I just look at the birds and I'm just like, okay, I want to look at the trees move. I want to just be, I want to put my feet in the grass. I need to counterbalance all this electronic energy that's just bombarding me, right? And we're all going through this. And um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how all of that incorporates itself into the new wave of wellness trends because we need those really uh, in a new way that we didn't need a year ago. Um, and I don't know, do you, do you think that people are going to do part-time work from home, part-time in the city? I mean, there's a lot of debate about that when we're thinking about anticipating trends for travel as well as just real estate and, and cities. What's your best guess on that? Because I, I've heard a lot of different opinions and they're not all the same. What do you think? I think that the um, future is going to be a hybrid of the digital and the physical across the board in many ways. I think that some people will um, go and stand in line for some things uh, at Whole Foods Mm -hmm. and they will have other things delivered. I think some people will go to work um, on one or two days and then work from home on others. I think some people will maybe drop into the gym and work in or take a class, you know, with friends and other people being around, and will also get on a treadmill in their basement or, you know, follow a workout from an app at home. I think that this constant ebb and flow of moving in and out of the digital and physical sphere is the new reality. And those that can seamlessly move in and out and don't have a rigid um, set of protocols of how they manifest that are going to be the ones that evolve. And I look at the children Mm -hmm. that have had to do at home schooling for a year and how well poised they will be for the future um, with this nearly intuitive in and out of the physical and digital world. The classroom can be both a physical place and it can also be a Chromebook. And I think that um, there's, there's a competitive advantage in being able to have fluidity there. What I would caution some of the um, Gen Z and millennials in the workspace is don't be over eager to relinquish that office space so that you can mm-hmm. embrace the freedoms of, you know, um, remote and no commute. Because there's a there's some of my biggest moves in my career have been fortuitous. They were in passing. Yes. They were an elevator ride I shared with um, a top executive. They were somebody seeing my um, the way I dress on a day in day out basis and the way I comport myself, um, all the things that you cannot represent about your personal brand on zoom calls, uh, that can happen in the physical space. And you might argue, well, nobody else is going, well, it's just as much about what people do when, when you think that they're watching as when they're not watching. And that goes, that goes for acts of kindness. And your personal brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room, not when you're in the room. So I think that, uh, you know, that would be my word of caution. And for and for all the, the, the folks from other generations and who are more conservative in their approach and feel like they want to go back to the office full time and, you know, and push back away from, from Zoom calls and be done with them, um, you know, you will not be evolving at the rate of which uh, things are changing because um, Slack is here to stay. Yeah. Zooms and, and, and Teams are here to stay. Everything else that you maybe resist is going to be a part of it in some way. But I think that uh, I would hate to see um, 
office culture dwindle away because I think it provides a lot of important value. I have, Absolutely. even on days where I did not need to go into the city, I have gone into Manhattan for a surge of, you know, New York energy. I was know. just going to say that. You're talking about New York, you know, a New York minute, that New York energy of the best of the best are all around you and something amazing is going to happen because you're who knows who's going to be around the corner or like you said take that elevator ride with you and that's not going to die just because we have zoom i mean so i i couldn't agree more you you need both and isn't it magnificent that one part of the day you can be talking to someone in another country and then later on you can have someone and you know you can meet an in, in person uh meet them in person for lunch so I don't know. I agree with you. A blend is really the way to maximize all of this. I, I couldn't agree more, Pablo. Are there any other things that you'd like to leave our audience with? You've, you've given us a lot of great insights. I, I really appreciate your time. Any parting thoughts? Um, no real words of, of wisdom to, to impart right now, but I know that, you know, regardless of where people are listening, they're at different stages of this experience. Mm. Even in the United States, this has manifested itself in different ways. And each individual experience, regardless of where you are in the world or, or what your personal set of circumstances are, whether you've been furloughed or lost work or your industry is actually seeing a boom during this time, you know, the human connection that we talked about mm -hmm. at various points um, and bringing a level of mindfulness to that human connection, I think will be more important than ever. And so whether you choose it, you know, the physical space, mm -hmm. Zoom, or even um, as I've been doing quite frequently, just calling people, you know, uh, and being on the phone, which is nice because I don't have to, you know, Ta yeah. use more of, tax them with more zoom energy you know yes. um, is 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 an, a, a great ingredient for how to find your own formula for moving forward and yes it feels like, like a very optimistic time because we're kind of getting out of this experience yes but this is the time where we need to even be more conscious and we need to be connecting with people because i think that there, when we had a collective struggle we were all in this like, hey, let's rally together. And I think it, it would be a shame to see people being left behind in any way as we all kind of get back to our normal, hey, things are fine again. Um, that's maybe when we need to be our best for other people. We need to show up in different ways. Yeah, keep checking in. Keep checking yeah. in with people yeah. you care about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I guess that was a much more, <laughs> a simpler, uh, a more concise way of saying what I was trying to communicate. No, so Pablo, everything you said is really transformative and accurate and exciting. And I thank you so very much for all of your insights that you shared today. It really has been a pleasure and I hope to talk to you again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it.